Hello everyone, this is Shane Gibson with RackN and today we're going to do a short demo video on community content for digital rebar provision. The community content is the freely open and available uh, content that is downloadable and usable in your digital rebar provision server. You can find all the information on digital rebar at our website on rebar.digital and today we'll be demoing a little bit about the UI as well as the CLI interaction with both downloading and using and exploring content. To get started with, uh, I have a number of servers. Oh, looks like Packet's got a little bit of an issue here, so let's go ahead and reload that page. I have a number of uh, servers that have been set up and deployed using digital rebar provision in packet.net and today we're going to use the server 7 uh, which is 79.171 IP address it's just been installed with a stock CentOS 7 distribution other than that there's nothing uh, unique or interesting about it other than it's installed and up and hopefully reachable since uh, looks like packet.net is having a little bit of an issue however uh, what we're going to do is first log into the node. Yep, so we can reach it. And I have not hit it before, so I don't have the server address. And we're going to log into it in two screens. And uh, we are going to then install the uh, version uh, from TIP because the current version in TIP has the DRP uh, community content version information that we need. The stable version has a, a few bit, of, a few issues. This variable ver tip to uh, tip, and then we're going to curl the install config and, in isolated mode. And we are not going to specify the dash dash no content uh, flag because that flag would say do not install the DRP community content. You would choose to use that flag if, for example, you want to use the RackN uh, registration advanced uh, operating system and uh, plugin content, or if you're going to use your own content and didn't want to leverage the existing community content. So the installer is simply just going to go through, set up some dependencies for us, then it's going to pull down the DRP version uh, from TIP, uh, which is based on the 3.1. Uh, current 3.1 server version. So right now it's actually uh, doing the digital rebar provision uh, piece. Uh, what we're going to do after that is start the uh, server up in uh, the foreground so we can watch the output of the server um, in the foreground. And then we're going to load the community content uh, ISOs. And I'm just going to fire those off because they take a few minutes to download the package repos and uh, uh, load them up and explode the ISOs and then I'll walk through everything uh, how we got to those uh, specific community content pieces. And so there we go we've got our server completely up and running and now we're going to uh, fire off all three of the content downloads over here on the purple screen. So in the purple screen we're going to fire those off and we see sure enough we've got our API calls uh, hitting our uh, DRP endpoint and we've got stuff going on now. So let's examine a little bit um, what the community content actually means in terms of um, what it is. Now essentially uh, DRP CLI is the command that in interacts with the digital rebar provision server and we can use it to um, manipulate the configuration of the uh, DR provision server. We can also show what's uh, configured on the DRP server. So in this case, let's look at the contents show. Uh, so we've got contents show DRP community content. Just pass that through JQ. And then we will be able to, it will take a moment because as it's doing the explode ISO, uh, the server blocks for a few minutes as it's uh, writing content to the file system. And then we'll uh, be able to get the response back from the server. Uh, that was a, a new thing I learned recently, setting up this demo and how that interacts with the server. So the explode ISO functions are uh, uh, cause you a little bit of a, a temporary burp. 
so to speak, in the server. So there we go. We've uh, gotten the ISOs, and we see we've got a whole bunch of this JSON stuff. And all of this JSON is just a roll-up of multiple pieces of content. So it's just what we, or at least I refer to at uh, Rackn as a content pack. So in this case, it's the DRP community content pack. And it includes our first example is the CE CentOS install uh, boot environment. We see that there. And if we scroll down, we'll actually see that there is the uh, CE discovery uh, content pack, uh, content boot environment. And then we've got the sledgehammer. And then we should see down here the Ubuntu. So those are the four uh, uh, boot environments that are included in that content pack. And as we can see, there's a whole bunch of information that describes it, including things like where to download the content from. Whoops, we didn't mean to actually cut and paste that. Um, and then there's some other metadata related to it. And there's some, con the, some specific information regarding the content, uh, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit further. OK, so the DRP community content was installed by default. And we had these boot environments that we wanted to load. What if we didn't know what boot environments were included in the content pack? so that we would need to know to do the upload ISO procedures to be able to install the actual um, ISO images into our digital rebar provision endpoint server. Well, that's pretty easy. We can go back to our handy uh, JSON, and we are going to simply uh, list all of the boot environments and use JQ to pull out all of the names, uh, quite simply. And so we see that we have a couple of uh, names here and a few more than we just talked about. Ignore and local, they're special and internal and they're basically boot environment states that mean quite literally what they say. Ignore this host if you set it on a, a host or a machine. Uh, local means have the machine boot on it via its, its local disks according to its BIOS configuration. And then we have the CE Discovery and CE Sledgehammer, which in this case, Discovery and Sledgehammer are actually the same image. They're the Sledgehammer image. Uh, in the future, uh, or you might choose to uh, separate the Discovery image from the Sledgehammer image, where you might do some additional heavy lifting tasks with the Discovery. When you discover a node, you might register it in your backend configuration management server uh, or CMDB or asset management system of some sort, independently from the actual Sledgehammer. Sledgehammer is a live boot image that will boot via Pixie into live boot, which is based off of a CentOS distribution. And then it will provide you all the helpers to install the operating system on the platform. Uh, but we also see, most importantly, the CE Ubuntu and the CE CentOS uh, packet uh, boot environments here. So now we're sort of figuring out what content we have, what we need to be able to do to get on content on the machine to make it usable. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Ubuntu uh, distribution and see what's actually comprised of that. Now we've actually seen it already very briefly when uh, I did the, the contents uh, show command, uh, this is all wrapped up in the contents show. So essentially, there's nothing unique about it. It's just the JSON blobs that are grouped together to provide one pack for us to quickly and easily install a bunch of stuff at once. In this case, we have some boot parameters which are defined, which uh, help us with the boot process and that's specific to Ubuntu. And then we have our init RD and our kernel, which is necessary for the boot stages. Uh, obviously, our name and some metadata about the uh, OS itself, including uh, what we were looking at a little earlier, the uh, mirror in which we would download the ISO from. So when we did the, uh, previously I kicked off the DRP CLI boot ends upload ISO command, this is the URL it went to, downloaded the ISO, stuffed it into the uh, TFTP boot ISOs directory, and then the explode underscore ISO dot shell script ran against it and exploded it out into the TFTP boot directory so that we have all of the bits and pieces necessary to pixie boot and install an Ubuntu distribution. Uh, now we're getting into a little bit more interesting stuff here with optional params. So params are essentially variable information 
uh, that we need to be able to operate on in this boot environment or this boot environment can consume these params to be more correct since these are optional params. In this case the operating system disk we can define which disk via setting a param uh, that we would want to install the OS to. Uh, we can set the default password hash that would set the root password uh, or the inbuilt uh, default user uh, you, and we can specify the default user name to pass through into the seed during the install. We can add some SSH keys. Uh, incidentally, uh, Victor Lowther from Racken uh, just covered this in the recent V002 uh, digital rebar meetup. He did a short demo of injecting uh, change password and SSH keys. Uh, then we can also uh, change the kernel console where it actually logs which console it logs to. And this is important for some environments like packet.net which has their uh, uh, serial console logging go to TTYS1 instead of TTYS0 as some places might exist or a physical console which would be TTY0 on a host. There are no required parameters, so that those are not necessary. But the next very interesting piece of content are templates. Templates are used specifically to uh, create a small block of code that does one thing. And the, uh, the goal and the mantra at Racken is small, tiny, composable uh, things that you can combine to do interesting and useful things in a larger sense. And templates are one of the foundational uh, pieces that allow us to do that. So in this case, uh, we have some you know, helper stuff for the actual uh, Pixie process and the boot process and uh, Lilo uh, uh, bootloader. But more interestingly, we have the actual seed itself, which we define. So in this case, CE net seed temple which is a template file. And then we also have a CENet post installed at shell that template. So these are actually uh, additional content pieces that are rolled up in the DRP community content package, which enables us to install, in this case, an Ubuntu distribution. So let's actually bore down a little bit more. So we've looked at a, the DRP community content. We've looked at the uh, boot environment itself. Uh, we've iterated over which boot environments we've had, we have, and now let's bore down into a template. So let's take a look at the template itself, and similarly, we are just going to run uh, drpcli templates show ce net post install .shell template again, pass it through JQ, boom shakalaka, there we have. So here we've got our actual ce net post install template which we see is a JSON blob, but we have an embedded a sir, uh, excuse me, bin shell script, which is not very exciting or interesting to look at. And in fact, it's pretty hard to kind of debug what's happening in there. Now, if you squint your eyes and turn your head just so, you might be able to figure it out. Uh, you'll be able to pick out some interesting things. For example, CE root remote access dot template. Hey, wait a minute, we're in a template and we're actually calling additional templates. So you can actually embed templates within templates and we have some ability to do some fancy template and sub-templating capabilities that allow you to do some more advanced con uh, uh, constructs within your uh, content. And all of this language is based off of Golang template and we'll see that these are the expanders that actually expand in line uh, before it's passed through to the machine uh, to actually expand the template before it's served to the machine. But again, this is not very pretty. So this is where we can go and take a look at our handy dandy web UI. And we're actually not looking at the web UI of the DR provision server itself we're working with, but I have preloaded the URL. We're gonna start it up. Since it's the first time we've started it, we have a self-signed cert we get a self-signed cert error message, blah, 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 blah. We have to accept that, reload, all right. Boom, there we go. We've not changed the username and passwords. So we log in with the defaults. And now we have our endpoint, so 79.171, which we were working with earlier. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to go take a look at this uh, template. So we're gonna take a look at the templates 
and look at the CE, what template were we looking at? Net post install shell template. So our UI automatically unravels all of that contents stuff in uh, the JSON blob for us and makes it nice and pretty and easy to see. Now, if this weren't a read-only template, we would be able to edit this template and make changes to it, which would be reflected back into our system. However, since we're using currently uh, community content, which is all based on read-only content, uh, you would need to clone that template specifically before you wanted to were able to make any changes to it. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll just call it, uh, does it inject the clone? name for a CE clone, we'll call it that, I'll say add, and we come back here, oh, that's right, we've got a little bit of a UI bug, we've got a, a ticket open for, got to reload the page after doing a clone operation like that, but here we go, we have our clone of the template, and now we can actually edit it, make changes, etc., and so that's one way you can act, uh, take an existing template, make modifications to it, and make it your own for your own environment. Uh, it also makes it a lot handier to view through the templates. Now, if we were to go back a little bit and step through what we just did at the command line, we could go to the content field and we would load the content panel. In this case, we're not logged in with a RACN uh, account, so we don't see any of the register-only content. We only see the free uh, open content, which is the Kube spray, spray local store and DRP community content, which is what was installed for us when we installed the server because we did not select the no content option. Uh, within that DRP community content, we looked at boot environments. So here we go. Here's our boot environments. We have the CE CentOS, CE Discovery, Sledgehammer, Ubuntu, Ignore, and Local. So those are the same exact uh, boot environments we looked at uh, from the command line, we can bore down on the Ubuntu 16.04 install. And if we come down through here, we can see this is essentially a reflection of the JSON information. And we can see that we have some templates, and boom, there we go. There's our CE net post install at shell that template we were just looking at previously. Again, we can bore down on that. Here we go. We can see that we have some of the content here. Uh, we, since we're actually in a, a, a VI sort of edit-like um, uh, panel within the contents panel, we don't actually have a link serving out to the next step down. It's a refinement we'll have in the UI a little later. But in the meantime, we can take a look at the CE root, root remote access template by going to the templates page, going to CE remote root access template. And here we go. Here's the template blob itself. Some helpful information on how to use this information. And it basically says, again, here's our expansion of our Golang templating language. It says if the parameter exists, access keys. So if we've passed in a parameter called access keys, then let's go ahead and use it. And we'll make their root SSH. And we'll cat the authorized to the authorized key files. We'll create this header. It says begin generated content. Uh, and then we'll walk through the access keys and inject them into that file. And that's pretty much it. That's how you would uh, customize which SSH keys are injected into your uh, root user account. Uh, that's a fairly br uh, fast walkthrough. Um, if we wanted to actually see the similar content we just, just showed you in the web uh, for the root access keys, we can go ahead and do that again. DRP templates show CE root remote access template, pass it to JQ, and then we see the same sort of thing in our JSON content. What's interesting to note about all of this is we looked at the uh, uh, DRP community content and we showed that it's this JQ blob that we had just looked at. You can literally take this JQ blob write it to a file and say my content and edit it ah, stock Ubuntu or stock CentOS thank you very much and you can actually edit it make changes and now you literally have your own content pack that you could inject back into another uh, DRP endpoint uh, also since you can manipulate the configuration of the DRP endpoint 
so easily, it allows you to instantiate new DRP endpoints with specific content and conjunction with the read-only aspects, you can stand up a DRP endpoint very quickly. As you saw from the demonstration, uh, we actually started up from nothing and had content installed and ready to rock and roll very, very quickly. And so it gives you an idea of how quickly you can build up an, a, a DRP uh, provisioning endpoint from almost nothing. Um, the only last piece that needs to be done to, uh, or a couple pieces that need to be done, is to set the uh, preferences uh, to in, actually use the boot environments appropriately. So right now the defaults are uh, f default is local, so if a machine pixie boots off of us, we don't want to overwrite it by mistake unless you, the operator, intended to. And so you actually don't uh, have the boot environment set to anything. So we would say in this case, if we wanted to start up the process of installing uh, to uh, with our system, we'd set the sledgehammer. And the unknown boot environment says, if I've never known or heard from a machine, what are we going to do? And the, instead of the default of ignore, we're going to discover it. And once we save that, then our preferences get set. And then we would add a subnet that relates to um, our network configuration of our environment that we're going to install. Um, in the packet.net environment, we don't actually use subnet specifications because we use spe special helper content from the rack gun uh, we just switched over to another provision, uh, DRP provision endpoint, which is I've used to bring up these uh, nodes in the packet.net environment. And in that case, there are no subnet specifications, but the uh, plugin, uh, excuse me, the uh, packet, con oh, that's why we need to reauthenticate. Our endpoint is connect, connect, connect to our endpoint, reauthenticate. Ta da, there we go. Um, so, our plugins, we have a packet uh, plugin which allows us to manipulate packets hosts, and we also have uh, other special content that allows us to operate within the packet.net environment that makes it uh, easier to operate on. Uh, and we've just actually lost our endpoints. We were connected to uh, just juggling different endpoints. So let's jump back to 79.171, log in. There we go. Uh, and then back to the global setup we were referring to. So we've got our preferences in our ISO setup. You would add a subnet if you're not operating in the packet.net environment and our content um, not sure why it's showing us an X because we have content there so uh, that might be a little bit of an issue we need to clear up but we we do have content so the DRP community content is actually loaded there um, so that's a little bit of an error in the UI uh, we don't have any machines because we haven't booted any machines and discovered them um, but they would actually boot and install uh, now and then machines would show up under your machines tab. Uh, so that's pretty much it uh, uh, in regards to content. Some of the last pieces uh, that I'll just quickly point out before wrapping up is in isolated mode there is a DRP data directory which is uh, the source of all of the content by default uh, on your DRP endpoint and in this directory we have uh, the digital rebar directory, which has a whole bunch of subdirectories in them, which actually contain the uh, exploded out content that we are going to use. In this case, uh, CE net post install template.json. Um, these are the customized uh, temp pieces in, in the case of the clone that we created. And then we have uh, the TFTP boot directory, which contains uh, our ISOs. So when we did the boot uh, env uh, upload ISOs command, this is where it staged these ISOs for us. And then it exploded them out, in the case of the sledgehammer, into sledgehammer and its SHA-SUM directory. 
And so there's our actual content for that. And then if we wanted to look at the Ubuntu uh, 16.04, we actually see our Ubuntu 16.04 uh, directory, which contains our exploded out files for doing the Ubuntu install. And then last, if you're interested in the API, there is an inbuilt uh, Swagger uh, UI component that allows you to walk through what API commands look like in regards to content. So you can actually create and manipulate API or content through the API, not only through the UI or the CLI. Incidentally, the UI and the CLI both ultimately call the API at the very bottom layer. Sometimes it's uh, easier to operate with the command line interface for us humans instead of composing uh, uh, sort of onerous curl commands. So this would be an example of uh, API usage to set the preferences for the default boot environment, the default stage environment, which doesn't apply to us in this case because we're uh, installing community content, not the rack in registered content. Setting the unknown boot environment to CE discovery in this case. So that's our actual JSON blob. We would get an API key from making an authorization request with our username and password. We'd be given a key that gives us permission to do this. Then we would run this with a few headers. We would define the data as the JSON blob. We'd execute it against our API pre uh, prefs, uh, API v3 prefs, uh, API endpoint, and then boom, we would actually modify the uh, boot environment uh, for the unknown and default boot ends configuration. So to explore all of that, you can use the Swagger UI, which is going to be at your HTTPS uh, server Swagger UI, and then it gives you this nice interface. One thing to note, if your uh, digital rebar provision server is remote to your web browser, i.e. it's not running on localhost, uh, when you first load this, you will actually have to modify by hand the uh, IP address or uh, host name in the uh, endpoint and then you would authorize uh, with uh, the information so rocket skates and rocket skates we authorize and now we actually have a token that we can use in conjunction with the uh, swagger UI to explore the swagger UI and in fact we could look down at the prefs uh, um, look at the prefs and then look at the post and we could actually look at what we wanted to do as an example so if we wanted to set the uh, preferences as such we would drop it into the body and then we would say try it out and then boom we would get on the fly our full-blown full-fledged uh, curl command the URL that we hit, the response body we received back from the API server, the response code, and the response headers. Ta-da, success. Thank you very much, everyone, for bearing with me and learning a little bit more about community content and digital rebar provision. Look forward to seeing you 